I mean, it is October, so I feel like I should be giving y'all the spooky vibes, but it's no spooky vibes except that I'm wearing all black and I have black lipstick on. That's it. That's the spooky vibes. Hey y'all, it's Ashley Bookishram and I am back with another video. Today we are here to do the first video in a new series. And this new series is, is this book problematic? I don't know why I decided to do that drama field. I did. No rhyme, no reason except let's just be traumatic. Not traumatic, dramatic. Oh my goodness gracious. Words are very hard. Anyway, either way, beside the point, we are here to do the first in a new series in which I am going to be rereading and revisiting some of my childhood favorites to see if they hold up. And maybe some of these won't be my childhood favorites, but books that were published that were available to me, that were accessible to me as a kid, which was not very diverse. A lot of them are problematic, but I thought it would be fun to revisit them because we've been having a lot of conversations in in my field about <laughs> about the place of these books in our literature in our current wave of reading and especially when we're talking about kids nowadays in the 21st century here in 2022 picking up these books what does it mean for them so the first book that I'm going to be covering in the series actually I was going to attempt to read the first few in the series but I thought that I would have enough content and material just to talk about and covering this one book and as you can see probably from the cover or the thumbnail I'm going to be talking about Little House on the Prairie by Laura Ingalls Watt. not Little House on the Prairie look at me already messing up y'all Little House in the Big Woods, which is the first book in the Little House in the Prairies, a series by Laura Ingalls Wilder. I am not going to continue to hold this book up because, my God, my arm will get tired. But just a quick synopsis, this is the first book in the series that is based on Laura's life. This is where we get the introduction to Laura and her family. This book does not have much plot. I'll go ahead and tell you that right now. Outside of what I'm going to talk about in terms of its significance, its place in literature, as well as some of the controversial content in this book, this book has no plot. <laughs> there is essentially no plot. It covers the family's life day to day, living in the woods as pioneers, settlers, I could say colonizers, but I'm not going to take it that far today. But we do follow them day to day. So we get to learn a little bit about their family structure. We get to learn about how they celebrate holidays, what it's like when they visit friends and family, what they do in certain situations. There was a point in which Ma and Laura are having to confront a bear. And it was actually quite funny because Ma ended up slapping the bear. Now, how true that is to Laura's actual life, I have no idea. We're not following a succinct plot in this book whatsoever. This is more of an overview of what it was like to live in the 19th century as a frontier person person, a settler, whatever you want to call it, that's that's the basis of the story. So just a little background about this book and why these books have been coming into spotlight in the past recent years. If you did not know, of course, this book takes place in the mid 1800s. I believe this first book takes place in 1871. There was a lot of spotlight kind of put or shown onto these books because the American Library Association had an award that was the Laura Ingalls Wilde Award, which really celebrated the legacy of authors that specifically wrote in children's literature. After some of the content in these books, the casual racism was highlighted as well as there is some kind of like, what is it called? Manifest destiny. I couldn't even think of it. Some stuff like that going on, people were feeling like, okay, because of the content of these books, maybe this award should not be named after her. And so the American Library Association made the move to remove her name from the award. And now it is called the Children's Literature Legacy Award. So that's where the controversial content kind of started with the series. I mean, it's been highlighted before, but I think it was really definitely brought to the forefront when that information was coming from the American Library Association. Now, my own personal history with the series is I actually read most of the series as a kid. It was one of the series that was accessible to me as a kid. I grew up watching a little bit of the TV show, of course, because my parents had grown up watching. Well, my mother, my dad is not from America. My, my mother grew up watching a little bit of the TV show. So it was just kind of one of those things that was continually passed on from one generation to the next. And so it was interesting for me to reread this book because 
honestly, I don't remember any of the controversial content from it as a child. And that kind of goes to show how we as children sometimes do not process things that are happening in the greater expanse of the world because we don't have that experience yet. And so going back and reading this now at 31, it was very, I don't want to say shocking, but it was kind of telling to go back. No, I lied. It was shocking because I, I was expecting some things, but I don't think I was expecting what I got out of this book. So here's where I kind of stand on this. Do I think that this book is problematic? In some ways, yes, I do. When I went through and I wrote my review of this book, which you can find on Goodreads, I kind of wanted to look at this book from two different angles. So this is a book of its time. That's without a fact. It is a book of its time. I know that a lot of people hold this series and these books dear to their hearts. They grew up with them. They love them. But what I've been finding a lot of times is when people read these as adults and they review them, the content that is harmful is not always talked about. And I think that that is where the issue really comes in. These books are great insights to what it was like to live as a settler in the 1800s and their day-to-day -day experience. From a historical standpoint, I can understand why a lot of kids would like these, the adventure, the lessons learned, they're living in the woods, you know, they're living off the land. I think that a lot of kids find that aspects of it interesting. However, as I said in my review, I think that it is important to also acknowledge the harm that these books have done. Because while one group may find these books extremely comforting, I can't begin to imagine how harmful or the harm that has been done to other groups that have read this book. So there are two things that are specifically highlighted in this book. I know that this first book doesn't include as much casual racism as other books in the series. I think this one is kind of on the lighter side than other books, which once again kind of says a lot. I think Farmer Boy also is kind of toned down a lot. But one thing that stood out to me that was just kind of rubbed me the wrong way and shocked me as an adult was Pa was singing to Laura and her sister. And at first the song just start off with uh, all around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel, da 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 da, -da, -da pop goes. So Laura was really, really fascinated with the fact that her father would kind of like strum, he had to be playing a banjo. <laughs> I'm just assuming here, it was the guitar, it was a banjo. And she could never, when he did the pop goes, she could never see his fingers kind of like pluck the, the strings. And then he shifted to a different song, which uses the term darky. If you did not know, darky is a racial slur in reference to black people. It is a well recognized song that a lot of people sang during that time period. It is cataloged by the Library of Congress, the whole nine. So if you look that song up, if you just Google Darky and then Little House in the Big Woods song, that song will come up, not just in the context of this book, but that song on a national level. And so hearing that song, it's gripe or grappling with the idea that this was something that was just nationally or within these communities of settlers it was a song that was just sung for fun and realizing that that is just such a high level of casual racism that I think even as a grown woman I just could not process it I cannot tell y'all how many times I went through and read that line over and over like well maybe I'm interpreting this line wrong maybe I'm just which is why I looked it up in the first place because I said well what if my interpretation is wrong no my interpretation was right that's exactly what it's in reference to and so it goes to show the casual racism that it existed during this time period, which was normal to Laura and her family, but is not normal or acceptable today in 2022. It shouldn't have been acceptable back then, but that is the historical aspect of it, whether we like it or not. My whole idea and thoughts about these books is that they have their place in history. They have their place in children's literature. This is not a video where I would say, because ironically this video is going up after I just did the video about canceling authors. This is not one of those situations where I'm like, oh, cancel these books, burn these books. First of all, if you know me, I'm a librarian. That means that from my own personal code of ethics, I don't tell people don't read this book. You shouldn't read this book. Let's ban this book. Let's burn. I just can't. <laughs> like, I just don't do that. Is it something that I would just highly recommend off the top of my dome? Absolutely not. But if someone wanted to read this book, my conversation to them would be, 
not necessarily my professional life, but outside of my professional life, you know, like, oh, I really want to read Little House on the Prairie or I want to read the first book in the Little House on the Prairie series. My first open means of dialogue with them would be like, hey, okay, I, you know, read whatever you want to read, but I recommend also checking out stories from this time period that give the perspective of marginalized, vo marginalized voices that are often neglected in series like this. Because one of the other problems is that the family often talks about their land and their house and no one ever addresses the fact that they are settling on land which technically does not belong to them whatsoever. And so we lose that native and indigenous perspective of people who were being pushed off of their land. It is just kind of like not talked about. I know that later on in the series that becomes a bigger issue as there are some comments that are made about native and indigenous communities that are extremely harmful. And as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, there was a specific line, I think Paul said, I don't know if they've been removed from later editions of the book, this quote, but he said the only good Indian is a dead Indian. And that was something that a indigenous child had to read in a classroom once. Her mother was highly pissed off. And so she moved for the book to be removed. So it does get progressively worse in terms of racial slurs or casual racism as it exists in the story itself. But it's so hard, not in terms of the racism, because we're not going to excuse any racism or casual racism or whatever you want to call it, discriminatory behavior in these books. These books do provide a good historical context, but I always ask people to pair it, like I said, with something that gives a different perspective, because in books like this, they were written from people who came from a different time. It doesn't excuse their behavior. It explains it, but it does not justify the behavior and it is wrong, but it's often good to pair it with other titles that provide a more thorough and robust perspective of what it was like for everyone to be leaving here. So I would not go as far as to say like don't read these books cancel these books and it's very interesting how American Library Association decided to handle the 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 naming of the awards, which is why it's always kind of a dangerous thing to use anybody's name for any award because we're human and humans don't do nice things all the time. And so you run into issues like this where people are becoming more socially aware or socially conscious of harmful materials. And believe me when I say children's literature has a lot, a lot, a lot of harmful racist <laughs> background. Quite honestly, I did a video uh, uh, probably over a year ago now where I talked about the whole situation with Dr. Seuss, who I also will be revisiting in the series. And I will link that up in the card symbol above where there were some racist things in Dr. Seuss's books and his own estate decided that they were no longer going to publish these books because they didn't want to continue to promote those harmful materials. Whatever was out there was out there. These books are still accessible. You can still buy them. If you go to your library, I promise you can still check them out too. And it's kind of the same with the Little House on the Prairie books. I think that there is much to be said about access. You don't want to take access away from people, but you want to provide people with a more accurate, thorough, and respectful perspective of times like these. These don't really, it gives you a very narrow and very one-sided perspective of what it was like to live in the 1800s. This is from a very white perspective and it is what it is. It does give a lot of historical context, a lot of information that I found fascinating, but I think my biggest issue when people read these books or when they review these books is that there's no sense of discernment and the harmful material. We're just gonna go off of nostalgia. And if you know me and you know anything when it comes to nostalgia in books, I understand connecting with books that you grew up with. They have a huge place in your heart. Trust me, believe me, I have books tattooed on my body right now that are harmful. <laughs> I get it because it was a place of nostalgia. It was a big part of my childhood and you should feel free to read whatever you want to read. I think it just does more harm than good when you don't acknowledge that, yes, I love this series. I grew up on it, but I know that there is harmful content in these. I recognize that this does not age well. I recognize that this is potentially harmful to a lot of various communities. And so that lack of my favorite word, my buzzword on this channel apparently now is nuance. <laughs> when there's that lack of nuance, you run into, for me, a lack of ability to, to really enjoy something 
but also say, I enjoyed this, but I know there's a problem with this. I know that this is not all good. And so I would not be a true librarian if I left this video without giving you three different books that you could read alongside if you want to, because I'm not here to judge you. You read what you want to read. But like, for instance, I, I as a parent, and this is an ad lib side note, I as a parent am not going to read these out loud to my child because I can't imagine reading this to my child and having to explain to her the context of this at a young age. If she gets older and she chooses to read these books on her own, we can have a discussion about that, but it will not be a read aloud that I personally will do. So I always say, if you choose to do that for your family or for yourself or whatever, that is perfectly fine. But I encourage you to read certain titles alongside this or certain titles instead of, but you choose what you want to do. But like I said, as a librarian, I would be wrong to walk away from this and not give you at least a few recommendations of what you could be reading alongside or instead of the Little House on the Prairie series. The first one that I'm going to recommend is one that actually takes place during the same time period and it's by one of my favorite children's authors and it's Christopher Paul Curtis and this is Elijah of Buxton. This takes place in the 1850s. It focuses on a young boy by the name of Elijah who lives in Canada which is right on Buxton, Canada which is right on the border of Canada and the U.S. and it is a free town. He is born as the first free person in that area which is a huge deal but there are some issues with how people view him. People call him fragile because he just doesn't like snakes, doesn't like, you know, wilderness type of situation. But then he finds out that a former slave has stolen money from a friend of his that was saving up that money to buy his own family. And so he has to work to catch the thief. I believe that Christopher Paul Curtis just has a way with just writing in general. And I love his writing. It's very lyrical. It's very informative. So if you're looking for a historical fiction that takes place in the same time period, but acknowledges the ex other experiences of people, I definitely would recommend picking this one up. The next one that I would recommend, which this one is often compared in, or it's not, I don't want to say compared. It's often recommended as an alternative or a read like read along, read beside, read, I don't know how you wanna, whatever you wanna phrase it. Either way, a lot of people use this as a reference when people are talking about Little House on the Prairies. And that series is the Birch Bark series by Louise Erdrich. I always get her last name wrong. I don't know what that is. Anyway, this book fo focuses on a seven-year-old girl that is part of the Ojibwa tribe and she is moving into a new community because of the fact that she is the sole survivor of a smallpox ep epidemic. It takes place along the same time as a Little House on the Prairie series and it follows her day-to-day -day and some of the situations that her and her community have to work through because of what white people have done within the area. So that is definitely one that I know whenever people think Little House on the Prairie, they often recommend that one in lieu of or if you want to read side by side in order to gain a more robust and well-rounded perspective. The last one that I want to recommend is A Prairie Lotus by Linda Sue Park, who if you've never read anything by Linda Sue Park, you're absolutely missing out. This one takes place, I think around the same time as well. And it follows a young girl who is half Chinese. She has moved to Dakota, before it was North and South Dakota, just Dakota. She moves to Dakota with her white father and ends up attending a school that she is excited to attend because it was her mother's wish for her to always attend a school. And of course, while she's there, she faces a lot of racism, but she finds her voice and grows confidence and gains a lot of friends and fulfills her mother's dream or aims to fulfill her mother's dream and so that I would just recommend anything by Linda Sue Park. I know this is not just a recommendation video, but I would recommend checking out anything by Linda Sue Park, but that is also a great addition to something to read in lieu of or beside the Little House on the Prairie series. All right, y'all, so that is it. Those are my thoughts and feelings of the Little House on the Prairie series. Well, at least the first book, Little House on the Big Woods. <laughs> I may slowly continue to read the rest of the series. And what I've been doing on Goodreads is I've been giving a as fair and objective review as possible. I am not rating these books because it just, 
I can't find it within my soul to rate them because of the fact that I, it's very complicated to rate a book like this. So I'm leaving most of mine unrated. I am planning on, like I said, maybe slowly reading the rest of the series, but I decided not to read any more specifically for this video because like I said, I felt like I would have enough content. Uh, this is going to be the first in a few series. If y'all have recommendations of books that you would like me to children's or I, I would say more children's because that's probably what this is going to be focused on. I was going to say, oh, maybe, you know, children's or middle grade. You know, I think we kind of mesh them together in the booktube community, even though they're two separate things, but that's neither here nor there. But yeah, if there's any childhood favorites that you have read that you would like me to revisit and kind of do an analysis on it, let me know in the comment box below. As always, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more content from me, click the subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications. If you're looking for ways to support my channel or follow me on social media, all links will be down in the description box below. And I'll be back with another video soon.